The first painting that you see when you enter the exhibition has the words the end at the top, um, but they're written backwards. So you realize that you are approaching from the other side of the end, meaning at the beginning or after the end of something else. And it's a bit of, of a joke about this conversation which has happened about the end of painting which I think is quite odd and, and sort of incorrect because in the history of painting, only very few voices have contributed to our visual culture. Um, so the idea that everything that could have been said is totally crazy to me. So um, this is like after the end of painting, the new painting and, and the painting is, uh, the frame is, sort of the shape of the sexual parts of a female body. There's kind of a breast top shape at the top and a buttocks shape at the bottom. Um, so it's also a little bit of a joke about um, the woman being the kind of like vessel, um, which is, would be the container for something rather than the content inside. And I intend to reverse that. I intend to sort of say that this missing content in the history of the painting would be the content from the woman perspective. The painting also has this cornucopia of fruit in the bottom kind of spilling out um, and there's a sense of light that there is something really extraordinary happening on the other side of the end. The next room um, you're introduced to a series of works which also have text at the top and this text is the studio and these words come from the title of an uh, Art Nouveau era art magazine, um, which started at the end of the 19th century and continued to the middle of the 20th century. And um, I would say this is probably one of the first so-called international art magazines. Um, when I discovered it, I, I loved the idea that this word, the studio, would encapsulate everything you needed to know about art in some way. And of course, I'm very interested in this kind of myth of, of artist voice having been already completely written. The studio becomes a kind of container for me to write new myths and new stories, um, or even fantasies. Um, there's a character, which is a broom, and um, it becomes a kind of active agent in the studio, and it stands in for a working person, or a woman, or a working woman artist. And um, she's kind of interloping through art history in this construction of the studio, um, making new myths and new stories. So this uh, broom character, which interlopes in the milieu of art occurs again and again in my work and it's just become an incredibly efficient vehicle for me to work with the figure, work with politics, work with feminism, work with representation. The broom itself being an actual tool and then the image of the broom being my visual tool um, is a kind of turn around the word broom that I really like. At some point, I started to imagine what would the face of this broom be? What kind of um, character could I give it? And the first time I tried to draw this fictional broom lady's head, I, I just put a wig on it and some sunglasses and a pair of lips, kind of like a Mr. Potato Head. And um, I liked how she looked kind of like a cool 60s girl. And I 
um, started to use this construction of her face as a series of windows and portals in which to view new things. Um, again, coming back to that idea of something new, a new world, um, a kind of alien world that hasn't been present before in a discussion around painting. And um, one of the paintings in this room, which is a series of the faces, um, has a red background that kind of fades to gold at the bottom. And the face of the broom in the front is, is darker than the light behind. Um, this was a very crucial moment for me to paint because I painted this lighting scenario again and again after this. Um, so the face reappears, but also certain ways to communicate placement of the viewer with light. Um, so this is what they call contrajour lighting, the light from behind or the light to be against the light. And um, again, I like how that implies that you are on the other side of something. Um, or like the way we talk about the dark side of the moon, what's over there? I kind of think about that with these paintings. I like the idea that the closer you get to her, the less you know about her, which is sort of the opposite of the way media makes us think about looking at a woman's face. So it's, sort of, it's a palette that you just kind of put things on in order to sell. Um, and it, this is kind of the opposite, like the closer you get, the less you know, um, which again to me implies like a sort of new territory of possibility to discover in painting. Around 2013, I um, really started to paint um, in a much smaller scale than I had before. This was due to uh, limitations which were financial and also um, regarding space in New York City. And uh, it was really a tough time for me, but being forced to work small was a wonderful crucible for me because it, it's like when you cook something and you let all the water come out and then you just get a very concentrated something at the bottom. I felt like that's what was happening to me with my paintings. So as the more I emptied them, the more I squeezed them before I just took out anything that was unnecessary, the, the better they got. And um, over time, over the past few years, I started, just in the past year or two, I started to kind of scale up again. And it's, it's very, each painting really needs to be a very specific size for what it means. Um, you know, the candle painting, I wanted the candles to be much larger than life because I wanted you to think of them as beings. So they're like human size. Um, this one particular painting of really, really large shoes, um, also called contre jour, is um, the heel of the shoe is a column, uh, an architectural column. So I really needed you to feel that these were the feet of a true giant and that the architectural columns are life-size, like a piece of a building you would confront in real life. So it's a very specific reason that this painting is really quite large. So in my work, um, I'm often talking about the history of painting as a place to start from or as a place to revise or comment on or occupy. One painting I've always loved it was uh, Sigmar Polka's paintings of herons, which he made many, many times. And um, I appropriated the form of these two um, birds at the sides of the painting um, in one of my pieces, which is also combined with the studio text. It's a way to maybe bring together the words, the studio, and how that to me connotes um, the history of art with an actual recognizable art historical image. Um, and the water, the, ren the water I rendered in the painting is actually a design in which the crests of the waves also form a profile outline of female breasts. So it's sort of this like female sort of sea. Um, and 
I like the idea that these two herons are kind of these uh, gargoyles that stand on each side of, again, like a new kind of endless world, like a sea where you don't ever see the end, you don't see the horizon, you see the, or you don't see where it ends on the left or the right, it just goes on forever. There are other paintings which recall um, artists from the 20th century and artists from the 19th century. Um, Magritte figures very, very large in my consciousness. Um, I've always been a Magritte fan and I, um, I'm actually very influenced by his work on paper, which is not as well known as his iconic images like the apple. Uh, and I did make a painting of an apple kind of in uh, homage to Magritte, who I love. And um, I also made a painting of two candles. Um, and the candlestick looks quite a bit like the head of the broom. It's very formally similar. I like how the broom kind of starts to become other objects um, in my work. The symbolic meaning of the broom starts to become the symbolic meaning of the candle or the symbolic meaning of another vessel or object. There is a very well-known painting by Gerhard Richter of a candle which I think this painting sort of recalls. This show has a room of paintings that we loosely call the mustache paintings. Um, I guess what unites them is that they all have a kind of painted frame in which a, a mustache appears at the top. It's very cartoonish mustache. It rem I think it reminds one of a villain or Salvador Dali or some kind of tycoon from uh, a comic book. Um, I, I have made these paintings intermittently over this last four years. Um, like the studio, like the broom, the mouth with the teeth and sometimes a mustache occurs again and again as a device for me to use to create the paintings. So at the time when I started making the mustache paintings, I, I was very frustrated and kind of angry and I um, I felt that if I would characterize my paintings as being created by a male, <laughs> I would um, perhaps feel like I belong more to the history and get some more attention for my work. So I, I painted a joke. I painted a, a garish sort of grinning giant mouth with a mustache at the top, which I thought of as okay, there it is, the sort of cartoon of masculinity, and now I can paint whatever I want inside of it. And um, as a lot of jokes go, it turned out to sort of be a really deep kind of harsh truth. And, um, but it also set me free, and it, it really allowed me to kind of bring my sense of humor into the, into the work in a way that I hadn't before. Um, so the mustache paintings are really generative for me. I think a lot comes from them. And... Um, there are, uh, there are a few that are sort of, I would almost characterize as revenge paintings. They're about people who made me mad or <laughs> what I would like to happen to them. <laughs> a smoking gun, uh, some tons and coins. That one's about someone who loves money way too much. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, it was, uh, those were a lot of fun to make. And um, I also got to experiment a lot with materials when I was working on those. So um, most of my paintings here are oil on linen. A lot of the earlier ones incorporate acrylic elements because of the type of space I was painting in. And the mustache paintings have watercolor, they have acrylic, they have oil, they just have a whole range of, of techniques. Um, and part of the beauty of the sort of mouth frame is that they can all hang together no matter how completely different each painting is, kind of unifies them. And um, the framing device itself appears a lot in my work. The studio becomes a frame, also becomes a psychological frame. And the illustration of the mouth frame um, what it makes me think of is I'm making something visible that exists but is invisible. So I'm painting context. I'm sort of showing 
that there is a context, which if we all accept, it seems invisible to us, but if we make it real and obvious, then we can have a new conversation. So um, in the final room of this show, uh, you'll find a painting called The Riddle. And this is based on um, Ang's painting of Oedipus and the Sphinx, which is at the Louvre in Paris. And um, this is one of my all-time favorite paintings from history by one of my all-time favorite painters. And um, I develop very specific relationships with certain paintings that then I want to talk about. So it's, it's not like any painting from art history is gonna work for me. It's, it's this particular one or that particular one, or I see it in a different way that um, I think hasn't been discussed, or I have a particular take that I want to expand upon. With this painting, the, of course the villain is the Sphinx. And I kept thinking about this Victorian idea where the, the female in the painting in that time was really rendered down to being only one of two characters, which would be the kind of like femme fatale or the Virgin Mary. Like you, you almost had these two extremes and there was no room in between. The figure of Oedipus is replaced with my broom character and I think it really changes the meaning of the painting. It's no longer about um, a Greek myth, it's about the myth of art itself or the myth of our shared notions of belonging to art history. So I, um, I think the broom, as it looks like it is inquiring of the Sphinx, we might ask ourselves why this dichotomy, why this um, you know, femme fatale or um, virginal character, why not more breadth um, of representation? And um, the, uh, this painting was a challenge to make. I, I really didn't know if it would work. I think a lot of paintings are that way. If you know 100% it's going to work, it's, it's not a lot of fun, and I don't think a lot of discovery happens. There's always something where you don't know what will be, and during the process of making it, I kind of got really afraid of it, <laughs> which, is, which is a good feeling for me when I paint. Um, when I'm a little scared of my own painting, I know, I know it's gonna be a good one, because, um, it means I'm not comfortable, and that's a good thing because I don't intend for my paintings to be a pleasant seat of comfort for someone. I want them to be questions, I want them to be um, evaluated and discussed and um, loved, if even for the wrong reason, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.